Okay, so we were looking at the Gospel of John last, literally last week, a week from ago today, and we were looking at a number of the features of of John. We we were looking at some of the uh, structure and features, is I think where we left off. Um, page three on your outline, we looked at. The basic structure, we have an introduction, chapter 1. Let's go back here. Introduction, and then we have the book of what? The book of signs before the hour. And then we have the book of glory, the hour of the great sign. And we then, of course, it, look, it concludes with a, an epilogue. All right, so the book of signs before the hour, the book of glory, the hour of the great sign. And we, we looked at how at a certain point, the end of chapter 12, the beginning of chapter 13, we see this transition where all of a sudden Jesus says the hour has come. And then there's this movement towards the, the cross where he is supremely glorified. We looked at the seven signs, I believe, didn't we? Yes, we did. Okay. And um, then the importance of the hour, how it had not yet come up until the end of 12, the beginning of 13, and then the hour arrives. Next, we want to move into uh, the deity of Christ in John, because this is certainly one of the distinctive features of John. One of the contributions of John is his great emphasis on the deity of Christ. One of his great concerns is to show who this person really is. Um, do you remember the purpose statement we had? Where is it back on page one even? What's the purpose of this gospel? John tells us in chapter 20, 31, what's the purpose? Okay, so those two concepts, who Jesus is, he's the Christ, the Son of God, and then believing they might have life in his name. So a major purpose then is to demonstrate, to reveal that Jesus is really the Son of God, which means not, not that he is uh, somehow lesser than God in his person, the Son of God, you know, therefore he's created. That's not... That's not the idea at all. The Son of God means He is equal with God. He is the same nature as God. Okay, so how does, how does John demonstrate the deity of Christ? Can you think of any examples of how he does that? If you were going to prove the deity of Christ from the Gospel of John, where would you go, Ryan? John 10, I think that is, yeah. Right, okay, right, okay. Okay, so the, he, he himself asserts his equality with God, and they understand what he's saying because several times they pick up stones to stone him. And even in one case, at least they say that he's making himself equal with God. Okay, good. Any other examples? Which, which says, and the word was God. Can't be more explicit than that, right? The word was God. The word clearly in that context is referring to Jesus. The word was God. That should convince everyone right but some don't take it that way have you ever had a jehovah's witness come to your door what do they say about john 1 1 anyone know? the word was a god so they believe that yes he is um, a special person but he is actually a created being we'll come back to that any other ideas about the deity of Christ in John? 
Okay, let me give you let me give you some categories to think about this question. First of all, he's called God. We looked at John one one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Any Greek students want to say that in Greek, for just to show off a little bit? Anyone? Don't be bashful. Come on. And arche. Come on, nice and loud. And arche en hologos kai. Oh, you guys are not inspiring confidence in the rest of the class. They're not going to take Greek next year after that. Okay, now let's look at John 1.1 1, 1 for a minute, um, or the context at least. Let's say you have a Jehovah's Witness come to your door, and you say, um, you, you point to this verse, see the word was... God. And they'll say to you, no, 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 no. You don't understand Greek. In the Greek, there's not the definite, definite article, the word was God. There's not the definite article in the Greek text, so that means the word was a God. Now, if you take Greek, you can blow them out of the water with that. Uh, because it's not true. It's not. It's true that it doesn't have the definite article, but they don't understand Greek grammar, and there's reasons we, you could go into. But let's say you don't know Greek. What would you say to them? Can you? Would you just say, "Oh, I guess Jesus isn't really God"? <laughs> I'll become a Jehovah's Witness. I hope you don't say that. You don't need to say that because there's something in this context that you can point to and say, no, 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 look what this says. Your view of Christ is wrong. You need to become a Christian. What what else in this context, the immediate verses, following verses, demonstrate the deity of Christ? Or demonstrate at least that their view is wrong. They think, they think Jesus was a created being. The first and greatest created being, yes. Above all other created beings, in fact, used to create other things, but nevertheless, Jesus is a created being in Jehovah's Witness theology. What would you point to? TJ? Okay, notice what verse 3 says. All things were made through Him. Jehovah's Witnesses would say, yeah, see, that's, that's fine. God created Jesus, or the Son of God, and then the Son creates everything else. So far, so good. But notice John adds something else in verse 3 to, 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 um, to ensure that we don't make that mistake. He says, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In other words, anything that is in the made category, the created category, comes from Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is not in the, that same category. John could have stopped at, in verse 3 by saying, all things were made through Him, period. But he goes on and he adds this next bit. And without Him was not anything made that was made to make it very clear that Jesus himself was not made. You see that? So if the Jehovah's Witnesses pull that on you, go to verse 3 and bring that out because that's a very powerful argument against their basic view of Christ. Okay, so he's also called God... um, Let's look at chapter 20, 28, this text, because um, there's something significant about it as well as just being called God. Um, Chapter 20, 28, this is Thomas' great confession. You remember doubting Thomas, he says, unless I see uh, his hands, the marks of the nails, verse 25, place my finger into the mark, of the nails, place my hand into his side, I will never believe. 
Jesus appears, verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Verse 28, Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Now, you might say, well, Thomas, if you were a skeptic, Thomas, he didn't really understand. He was just calling Jesus God. That doesn't prove anything. But notice the next verse. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. It's interesting, when you go to the book of Revelation, also written by John, right? And um, John is getting sort of a tour of the future from an angel. There are a couple of occasions when John is so overwhelmed by what this angel is showing him that he falls down and worships the angel. Do you remember reading that? Does that ring a bell? What, how does the angel re react? How does the angel respond? Right. Don't, don't do that. Worship God. Well, when Jesus, when Thomas falls down before Jesus and says, my Lord and my God. Jesus doesn't say, don't do that, worship God. He says, do you finally believe? So that, that is also a powerful text to um, not only see Thomas finally getting it, remember the purpose, John twenty thirty one. these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in his name. Thomas finally gets it. You're the, you, my Lord and my God. He believes. But also Jesus' response to that, that reaction is a, is a powerful affirmation of his deity. He also does the work of God. He does only what God can do. Chapter 1, verse 3, we've just looked at. He's... The Creator creates all things. Turn over to chapter 5 for a minute. <clears throat> Someone read verse 21 out loud for us. Whoever gets there first, go for it. Okay, so... Jesus does only what God can do, give life. Um, actually, look at verse 19 in this connection as well. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Now, at first glance, you might think verse 19 is actually saying, well, Jesus is not quite equal with God, right? Because the first part, truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. You might think, well, yeah, that, see, that shows Jesus is not equal with God. But keep reading. But only what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the, the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Now, if the son can if the son can do what the father can do what does that tell you about the son that he's as powerful as the father right so this is actually a strong text to prove the deity of Christ cuz Jesus says i see what the father's doing i do what the father's doing i can do what god can do so that's a powerful text as well okay next he claims equality with the Father. Uh, Ryan mentioned this. Let's look at a couple of these texts. Um, actually, if you're in chapter 5 still, back up a couple of verses. And um, you have at the beginning of chapter 5 this, this healing on the Sabbath. He heals this man, the pool of Bethsaida. And then it says, verse 16... Verse 15, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. 
Verse 16, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working, which is another uh, kind of verse of what we just saw. But then verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. There's the key phrase there. The Jews recognized that, and that, that's what boiled their blood against him. He was making himself equal with God, calling God his Father. They understood what Jesus was claiming. Um, how about another example, chapter 10? Chapter 10, verse 30 verses 30 through 33 this is uh ryan mentioned this one i and the father are one how do the jews react look at verse 31 the jews picked up stones to stone him jesus answered i have shown you many good works from the father for which of them are you going to stone me the jews answered him it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you but for blasphemy because you being a man make yourself god they get it. They get it. They should, and, and again, this is a part of John's purpose, as we're going to see in more detail. But remember the purpose of John, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you might have life in his name. There is a sense in which they recognize what he's doing. They see the signs but it doesn't pr produce belief in them. It produces hatred for, for him. So people react differently to Jesus. Okay, so those are some other texts that demonstrate the deity of Christ. How about this one receives worship, honor as God? We looked at the, the Thomas text. Um, chapter 523 is worth looking at as well. Chapter 5, verse 22, for context, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as, underline that in your Bible, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Strong statement. Couple of couple of more, the seven signs that Jesus does. These signs are interesting. We'll get into some of them a little more, but the seven signs. Notice what is um, John's commentary in chapter two, verse eleven. What's the first miracle that Jesus performs? The water into wine. Where does that take place? Cain of Galilee, good. And here, the end of that account, verse 11, John says, This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Now, remember, do you remember in the prologue, Chapter 1, verse 14, does anyone remember what that says from your knowledge of Scripture, John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, what? His glory, glory as of the only, the, the unique one from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the fact that, that these signs manifest His glory, manifests who He really is. Only God can do this kind of stuff. And when Jesus d does these signs, some of his glory is manifested. His true identity. Okay, one more. And that is the I am statements. The I am statements. There are several I am statements in uh, the Gospel of John. What's, what's the significance of this? Jesus' I am statements. 
Andrew? Okay, that's the name of God, right? Go back to um, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. And this is uh, God's special personal name He's revealing to Moses. This is the covenant name of God for, for Israel. He reveals Himself in this way. You remember the story in Exodus 3, the burning bush. Verse 13, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So the fact that John has these series of I am statements is supposed to connect you back to this. This is the name of God. This is the name of God. All right. So, you see these I am statements and you connect to Exodus 3. There's some other places you might connect to as well. Let me show you this. A couple of texts in Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah 43 for a minute. Isaiah 43. Look at verse Isaiah 43 and verse uh, 25. Okay, Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, in the Septuagint, what's the Septuagint, by the way? Greek translation of the Old Testament. This verse begins, I am, I am. What's the Greek phrase, you Greek scholars? For I am? Yeah, ego, a me. So this verse begins, ego, a me, ego, a me. Two of them. You actually have that a couple other times in Isaiah. Uh, let's just look at one more. Isaiah 51, verse 12. Isaiah 51, 12. I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you afraid? Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? Of the Son of Man who is made like grass and a forgotten Yahweh, your maker. So, I am, I am. And then, verse 13, Yahweh. Very clear. One other text, uh, turn over the page, uh, 52.6. 52.6. Uh, um, Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak, here I am. Again, in the Septuagint, you have two ego emis. And so John has these series of ego emis, I am statements. And if you're a reader of Exodus 3, if you're a reader of Isaiah, you know that Jesus is, is indicating more than just, uh, you know, okay, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. He is connecting himself with the name of God. Very powerful. What are some of the uh, I am's? I've listed the references, but I am the... Anyone know chapter 6? What's that one? I am the bread of life. Bread of life. How about the next one? I am chapter 8, chapter 9. Jesus heals a blind man in chapter 9. I am... I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. Chapter 10. 
There's actually two in chapter 10. Okay, good shepherd, but even before good shepherd, I am the door, and then I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, what happens in chapter 11? 11. Lazarus dies and Jesus raises him. So what do you think this one is? I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, Do you remember 14.6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then... Do you remember what chapter 15 is about? I am the... What? No? True vine. True vine. Good. Now, you might say, okay... Those are just, you know, I am the something... You don't have to connect the go and me with the name of God with these seven. Okay, you might say that, but there are some that are even more explicit, what we might call absolute I am's. Look at a couple of examples in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am. Most of your English translations add I am he, right? But in the Greek text, it's just ego me. Unless you believe that I am, um, you will die in your sins. Verse 28 Similar. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. One of the most powerful ones, I think, is verse 58. Um, And we need the context here. Jesus is talking, he's in conflict with the Jews here, and he's saying to them, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now that's a very strange grammatical construction, even even in Greek, but in English as well. Before Abraham was, I am? That's strange, right? What's Jesus saying? He is connecting himself to the name of God. He's, this is also a statement of his pre-existence before the incarnation. It's a very powerful statement. Um, and look at their reaction. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So they knew what he was saying, and it enraged them. Uh, let's see, and there's another, there's another, uh, well, let's look at chapter 13. This is a very important one as well. 13, verse 19. Jesus is telling them some things that are going to happen. And verse 19, he says, I am telling you this now before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe that I am. Now, this is important because it also connects back to Isaiah. You guys in Isaiah yet for OTS? We're next week, okay. There's a section in starting around chapter 40 where basically what... Um, Yahweh, God is doing, is showing his superiority over the other gods, the false gods. 
And one of the marks repeatedly in that section that God highlights to prove his own deity is his ability to tell the future. Which, if you're an open theist, you have real problems with that section. <laughs> because open theists deny that God knows the future. Okay? So, when Jesus makes this statement, not only is he saying, Ego e me, he's claiming the name of God, he is also connecting himself with Yahweh of the Old Testament, who alone can predict the future, and demonstrates his true deity. So, this is a powerful one. I'm telling you this now before it, take place, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am. Again, connect that to 2031, John's purpose in this gospel. Chapter 18 is a really cool one. Look at chapter 18, 5 and 6. <clears throat> you remember this context, they're coming to arrest Jesus. And then... Verse 4 in itself is remarkable. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, that he would go to the cross and suffer all that he would suffer. Um, if you knew, by the way, if you knew this morning, it, you got out of bed, and you'd, if you knew for sure that you would come to the auditorium and fall down the stairs break your leg, fall and break your leg and crack your head, get a concussion and be paralyzed. It's a bit extreme, but... Would you get out of bed and come to class? No way. If you knew you were going to be crucified, if you knew that you were going to bear the sin of sinners and suffer the wrath of God... Would you uh, go forward or would you go hide somewhere? I'd go hide somewhere. Jesus, verse, verse 4, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Wow. Jesus, in our uh, vernacular, Jesus is saying, Bring it on. But notice, Verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, Ego a me, I am. Not I am he, that's an English uh, addition. I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Verse 6, when Jesus said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Whoa. Something about the manifestation of that declaration, I am. I don't know what happened exactly. Maybe some of his glory broke out, his, his veiled glory, and they fall to the ground, which is the right way to respond to God. That's not how it really reads. Uh, they drew back and fell to the ground. Why would you do that? I mean, you don't intentionally fall to the ground. Um, in, well, yes, maybe. In, in the only intentional reason you do that is if you honor, if you're worshiping, right? Well, I don't think that's what they're doing because they pick themselves up and, and, uh, and arrest him. If they were worshiping him, they would not carry out their mission. They would submit to him. So that's another powerful one. Um, so there's these I am statements as well that are very, uh, very clearly um, affirming the deity of Christ. Now, it's essential, this is not on your handout, but it's essential to balance this emphasis on the deity of Christ with his humanity as well. Because John also presents Jesus as truly human. In fact, that's going to be one of the things, the, the earliest heresy about Christ is a denial of his true humanity. 
This is review. Why did people deny his true humanity? Right. Gnostics believe that the physical, which includes flesh and blood, that's inherently evil. That's bad. So Jesus wasn't really human, was the view. And John demonstrates Jesus is truly human. How does he do that? Can you think of any examples? Okay. He was hungry. He really ate food. So, natural human things, emotion, anything else? Tired. tired, yeah. He was tempted. Do you remember again John 1, 14? The Word became flesh. He's, he's God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. Even also another interesting one is um, um, this revealing himself to Thomas. What does Jesus have Thomas do or tell Thomas to do? Touch me, yeah. Now that's interesting because that's, that's even his resurrection body, right? Which apparently can somehow pass through doors and, and that kind of thing. So even in this resurrection body, it's still a physical body that can be touched. So John is, is careful to balance his emphasis on the deity of Christ with the real humanity, true humanity of, uh, of Jesus. You get the idea that faith, belief, is a major theme in John's Gospel. Okay. In fact, the first bullet point here, the only bullet point on the first page, the verb believe, Greek word pistuo, occurs 98 times in the Gospel of John. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little insight into a Bible study that I did on my own. I wanted to pursue this a little bit because this 98 times is a lot. First thing I did... Um, Went to my trusty Bible Works program. And um, I, first of all, just did a search on the term believe. Okay, found it showed up 98 times. Only interesting, an another thing is it only occurs as a verb, never as a noun. So this is an action that we are to take. And then what I wanted to do is find out, okay, do the other writers of the New Testament use this word that frequently? And so I looked, I looked up the word, I, I limited my search now to the, from, from just the Gospel of John to the whole New Testament, and the results are on the back of your handout. I just checked this word, uh, believe, the verb, the rest of the New Testament, and notice the next closest one is the book of Acts. It occurs 37 times. So 98 is huge. I mean, that's, that's more than twice as many. It's almost three times as many as any other writer uses this, this term. Okay, so that... that suggests that um, we need to pursue this and see how, since this is a major, major word in John, it's got to be a key to understanding the book. So what I then did is I copied all the references in John that have this, that have this reference to the verb believe. I copied them all. You can copy... Uh, the reference and the verse into your word processor. So I copied it into Microsoft Word, printed it off, and then I wanted to go through each one and see how this word's being used. And so I color-coded it. Didn't bring my color-coded sheet, but it's just, it just looks really interesting, all different colors. And basically what I found was six different categories in which this term uh, believe is used. The majority, you'll see the first column, is um, 
belief as, as the goal, potential. For example, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes. So that's the kind of thing that I'm looking at in this first co- category. Belief is described as, as the goal that you might believe. The next column is a column of actual, uh, actual belief. People who are said actually to believe in response to Jesus' signs or in response to something they believed in Jesus. But there's also a fairly large percentage of usage is where there's unbelief. They didn't believe in Jesus. And then the next two, sometimes it's command, believe in me. You believe in God, believe also in me, for example. Or question, do you believe? But then there's this last category that I want to look at with you that's very interesting. Defective belief. Defective belief. Uh, So believe it or not, not all belief in the Gospel of John is good belief. There is such a thing as defective belief. You might think, that's a very strange category, but I want, I want you to see it. I think it's very, very important, and I think it's part of John's purpose. So turn with me to chapter 2. Turn with me to chapter 2 and look at the last few verses of chapter 2, 23 through 25. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, again, what's the purpose of the Gospel of John? What is it? Okay, to awaken belief in Jesus, right? Is that a good summary? So Jesus should be really happy with the response of verse 23, right? Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Jesus should have been really happy. That's the, that's the purpose. That's the goal. And there is a sense in which signs can legitimately lead to faith. For example, look back at verse 11 in the same chapter. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So there is a sense in which the signs should awaken belief. Okay, so that's that's true. In fact, uh, just look at one more text, jump over to... Or, or I'll, I'll just read it to you. Chapter 10, verse 38 says, um, well, verse 37, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. Verse 38, But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and that I am in the Father. So Jesus himself is saying, these signs, these works... Demonstrate who I am, and so you you can believe because of these signs. Okay, so signs, it's okay to have them as a legitimate reason to believe. They are signs; they point to his true identity. But what this text, why John includes this text and some others like it, is to show that there's such a thing as false belief. Okay, and let me try and demonstrate that for you. Notice that Jesus is not happy with the response of verse 23. The people, notice verse 23. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But, verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Now, that word, entrust, See it in verse 24? 
Does, do you have a different word in your translation? Commit, maybe? Jesus did not commit. Everyone see that word? That's the same word. That's pistuo. That's the same word as verse 23, believed. So, in essence, what it's being said, they believed in him, but he didn't believe in them. Because he knew them. He knew that this faith, this belief, was not true faith. It was not saving faith. He exposes that this is not true faith. So what kind of faith is it? Basically, this is a faith that wants to just see miracles. So although signs can be a legitimate pointer to Jesus and means of faith, it's not a guarantee. It does not necessarily produce legitimate faith, and John wants people to see that. Okay. Now, this is illustrated in the next story. Follow with me here. Remember when John wrote this, when the biblical writers wrote, they were not writing with chapter divisions and verse divisions. Those were added later. So what happens in 23 through 25, I mean, that, that follows very closely on with what comes next. And next is the story of Nicodemus. Notice, notice the connection. First of all, verse 25 says, For he himself knew what was in man. 3.1 Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now let me just make a little, go down a little bunny trail here. This is why, this is one reason why, this is one example why, Gender-neutral translations are not good. You know what I mean by gender-neutral, gender-inclusive translations? A gender-inclusive translation would translate 225 like this. Uh, the TNIV translates it. He did not need human testimony about them, for he knew what was in them. Okay, makes it generic, so it doesn't exclude females. Right. The problem is John is intentionally wanting you to see a connection between verse 25 and verse 1. And if you change it to, instead of man, you change it to them or something, you lose that connection. Okay. So, for he himself knew what was in man, now there was a man of the Pharisees. And this man, this Nicodemus, is going to be an illustration of, of what was going on in verse 23. He's the kind of guy that believed in the signs. But it wasn't saving faith. Now, I'll show you another connection. A couple other connections. Verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night. Remember we talked about this in John's Gospel? Night means... Yeah, it's... Remember this light darkness motif? Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. He's still in the dark, spiritually. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now notice, notice this is the kind of faith that verse 23 is talking. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs. Nicodemus, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay, so Nicodemus is an illustration of the people in verse 23. You follow me? This is not saving faith because the next verse, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And, and Nicodemus just does not have any clue what's going on. Nicodemus is not born again, at least at this point. He's an illustration of these people who believe because they see signs but they're not saved. They believe, okay, what's the kind of belief? Verse 2, oh, God is with you. you. He really believes that miracles have taken place. And he concludes, God's with this guy. But he doesn't believe in the sense of he's born again. He believes that this is the Son of God. This is the one in whom there is life, whom I must entrust with my whole being. That's not the kind of belief. And so John, although his purpose is to get people to believe Jesus is the Son of God, 
and believing might have life in His name, He's warning us there's false belief. There's defective belief as well. So it's not saving faith that's described here in verse 223. Now, if you doubt that, let me show you some other examples. I could show you chapter 6 because we have the same situation in chapter 6. We don't have time, so let me just summarize. People see Jesus feed the 5,000. Whoa, cool. They follow him. They're even called his disciples. Jesus exposes it's just because they wanted some more free lunch. When the teaching got really hard, they left. They didn't follow anymore. And so Jesus turns to his twelve and says, Hey, do you want to leave also? Peter says, No, we've come to believe you are the Christ. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So there were these disciples, quote unquote, who weren't born again. They just followed because they liked the benefit, the free lunch, the cool freak show. All right, so let me show you another amazing example. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. Imagine growing up with Jesus. Now, we read the infancy gospel of Thomas where he's this little terror, killing people and, you know, that kind of thing. That's not really how Jesus was as a kid, just to clarify that. Imagine, how many of you have siblings? Most of you. Imagine if one of your siblings was sinless, perfect. I mean, wouldn't you want to punch the little kid or something? I mean, he'd just make you look bad before mom and dad again and again and again. And so here's an account of Jesus and his brothers. Um... Jump in verse 1. After this, Jesus went into, uh, about in Galilee. He would not go about in Ju- Judea because of the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the, fe- J- no, the, sorry. now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. Be careful how you say that word. It's not booths. Booths. So his brothers said to him, Leave. Okay, here are the brothers talking to Jesus. Leave here. And go to Judea that, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Then notice verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. They believed at one level. They saw these works that Jesus was doing. They saw the miracles. They couldn't deny him. And so they basically say, hey, you're a miracle worker. Why are you doing this in the backwater? Go down to Jerusalem and show yourself openly so that we could kind of ride in on your coattails and get a piece of the fame, a piece of the glory. That's really their motivation. One other text real quick. Chapter 8. Chapter 8, 31. Very, very interesting passage. 31 through about 47 or through the end of the chapter, really. But notice how this, this, this section begins. Verse 31, chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Why would he need to say that? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. They believed in him. Weren't they disciples already? Uh, No, if you follow this conversation out, (laughs) Jesus actually says they're sons of the devil. They're children of the devil. They They actually want to kill them. Look at verse 42. Jesus said, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. Verse 44. You are of your father the devil, 
And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer uh, from the beginning, etc. Verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Isn't that a strange word or a strange way to describe people who had believed in Jesus? Verse 31. Eventually, by the end, verse 59, they pick up stones to stone him. So this is not true belief. It's not true faith. They believe that Jesus must be some kind of prophet or something. He's doing some signs. We acknowledge that, but they don't really believe in him. What is true faith then? According to Jesus in this passage, verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So true faith abides in the word, which means what? It means they accept it. It means they seek to understand it. They love it. They try to obey it. They treasure it above everything else and they stick with it to the end. Doesn't mean they do it perfectly. Doesn't mean that they don't fall into sin from time to time. But they abide in it. True faith also loves Jesus. Verse 42. Uh, yeah, I'm in chapter 7. Chapter 8, 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. You would love me. So, they love Jesus. True disciples love Jesus. True faith brings, awakens in you a new relation to Jesus where you love Him. John, Jesus calls it Revelation 2, calls it the, your first love. First and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. If you're a true disciple, that's going to be true of you, not perfectly, but you're going to love Jesus, not just want the handout or the show. So, I think that's important to see in John's gospel. Understand his purpose is to awaken faith in people. Faith in Jesus as the Son of God who alone can give life, real life, eternal life. But along the way, John is warning people about false faith, a kind of faith that is not true saving faith. It's interesting, James, who is Jesus' brother, right? James didn't believe in Jesus at the time, but he was, would later, when he gets saved, he writes in his epistle, James 2.19, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. And he goes on with his uh, discussion about the nature of, of true saving faith. Let me ask you this. Is that the kind of faith you have? You can sign, uh, you can write your doctrinal paper for Mr. Glock. You can get your doctrine right intellectually. You assent to it. You believe there's a trinity. You believe Jesus is God at an intellectual level. Congratulations, the demons do too. The demons could probably write a better survey of doctrine paper than you could. But they're not believers. They're not believers. And uh, maybe you've been told your whole life, you know, all you, you know, all you need to do, you just, you just sign this prayer or say this prayer, sign this card, and you're on your way to heaven. Man, you're in. You just say the prayer, sign the card, you're in. And if anyone ever asks you, are you a Christian? You can show them the time and the place. You've written it in your Bible. There it is. I'm a Christian. That proves it. October 3rd, 1999, whatever it was. I'm not so sure. Maybe you're just happy to take the ticket to heaven, the fire insurance, whatever you want to call it. 
But when it comes to believing with Jesus with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and abiding in His Word, loving Him above everything else and desiring to please Him and obey Him, even though you fail and sin and have to come back again and again, confess your sin, but your heart is for Jesus Christ. Maybe that's not even on your radar screen. That's not what you signed up for, obeying. It's not in your affections. So, I don't want to create doubt if you're truly a believer, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's some people that have gotten saved at Emmaus who wrote the testimony for the application, but it was just the testimony the demons could write. So do a little soul searching. Are you any different from these people in the Gospel of John like Nicodemus who believe that Jesus was some kind of miracle worker but he wasn't born again? It's not that you've got to do something. It's really a gift that God bestows on you, awakens you, creates in you a new desire. To, you love Jesus. You want to obey His Word. And so pray that if you have not really truly believed that God would awaken that faith in you and give you a heart for Christ and a love for His Word above everything else. That's one of the challenges that comes from John's Gospel. John wants you to see that as he's writing about belief 98 times. He wants you to catch these few examples of false faith. Thank you.